Welcome to this uh, learning session on the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. We've now completed the code and then we need to start with the rules and regulations to the code. Again, we've completed the rules uh, relating to application to the adjudicating authority. We now come to the first regulation under this code. It's called the Insolvency Resolution Process for Corporate Persons Regulations 2016. Uh, this regulation is relevant uh, for the exams as well. Uh, the date is 01 December 2016. It was one of the first regulations to come up. In exercise of the powers conferred on 5, 7, 9, 14, 15, 17, 18, 20, 24, 25, 29, 30, 196 is the powers of IBBI to make regulations. It's the powers of the board and 208 which is the power to make regulations that these regulations are made. If you recollect the corporate insolvency part which is chapter 2 of part 2 started from 4 and ended with 32. So all these regulations are the procedural aspects of the provisions of the law contained in those sections. Short title and commencement. We'll skip it. Come into force on 1st December 2016. Definitions, I think the important definitions, committee means committee of creditors, dissenting financial creditors means creditors who voted against the resolution plan approved by the committee, electronic means means an authorized and secure computer program which is capable of producing confirmation or sending communication to the participant entitled to receive such communication at the last email address provided by the participant. Eligibility for a resolution professional, then we come to regulation 3. Who is eligible to be an insolvency professional? An insolvency professional is eligible to be appointed as such for a CIRP process. CIRP is the short form of corporate insolvency resolution process of a corporate debtor if he and all the partners and directors of the IPE of which he is a partner or a director are independent of the corporate debtor. So what does independence mean? So I can be a, see the law also permits IPEs. So as an RP, I have to be independent. The partnership firm, which is the IPE, which is the IP entity has to be independent. If the IPE is a company, then that company has to be independent. A person shall be considered independent if he is eligible to be appointed as an independent director. So if he satisfies section 149 of the Companies Act in his capacity, then he can be appointed as an RP. Please remember this independence is with reference to the corporate debtor. There are no independence criteria which is specified for the creditor. He is not a related party of the corporate debtor. The definition of related party you will have to go to the code. Is not an employee, proprietor or partner of a firm of auditors, company secretaries or cost accountants, cost auditors of the corporate debtor or is not a proprietor or a partner or an employee all three are covered of a legal or a consulting firm that has had any transaction with the corporate debtor amounting to 10% or more of the gross turnover of the firm. So please remember it's employee, proprietor or partner of auditor, company secretary, cost auditor, legal consulting firm. All this is relevant and the time period is, is the last three financial years. Just wanted to highlight later on when he is trying to appoint a registered valuer or any other professional, there the independence criteria is 5 years, whereas here for an RP it is only 3 years. An RP shall make relevant disclosures at the time of his appointment and thereafter in accordance with the code of conduct. Now, it also says an RP who is a director partner of an insolvency professional entity shall not continue as a resolution professional if the IPE or any other partner or director of such IPE represents any other stakeholder in the CIRP process. So it's both ways. If he is already an RP, he cannot get somebody else 
within his entity to do the registered valuation. So it's the other way. If somebody else has already done, you know, uh, is part of the process, then his partner cannot come in as a RP. So it appears both ways during this process. Access to books without prejudice to section 2D, 17 2D, the IRP can access books of accounts from where all depositories, information utility, professional advisors, other registries, most importantly, member, promoter, partner, board of directors and joint venture partners of the corporate data. Then we go to regulation 5. It basically defines an extortionate transaction which we spoke up spoke about in section 50. An extortionate transaction is one which is where which requires the corporate debtor to make exorbitant payments in respect of credit provided or is unconscionable under the principles of law applicable to contracts. We come to the next chapter of the regulation which speaks about public announcement. The act said the public announcement shall be made by the RP immediately after his appointment. Here it immediately is defined to be three days of his appointment. Second, where shall the public announcement be made? One English, one vernacular newspaper in the place where the registered office and the principal office of the corporate debtor are situated and any other place where the corporate debtor conducts material business operations. It shall be published on the website of the corporate debtor and on the website designated by the board. Okay. So this you have to remember. These are the three places and you also need to contrast it with the individual process where it talks about a public notice office of the adjudicating authority and website of the adjudicating authority which is the DRT there but here it is newspaper website of the corporate debtor and website designated by the board it shall also provide the last date for submission of claims what is the form in which the public notice is to be given it should be given in form A to the schedule if you flip a few pages of this regulation, you will find a schedule. So form A is the format of the public notice. Now, in this public notice, what is the time within which the creditor has to submit his claims? It will be 14 days from the date of the public notice. Who bears the cost of the public notice? The applicant bears the cost of the public notice. Can it be reimbursed? Yes, it can be reimbursed based on the approval of the committee of creditors to the extent it ratifies them. Can this form part of the insolvency resolution process cost? No. Cost of the public notice cannot form part of the insolvency resolution process cost. Claims by operational creditors. Now, once a public notice is issued, we go to next regulation which is number 7. The operational creditor shall file his claims in a prescribed format which is form number B of the schedule. In adjudicating authority rules, it was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Here it is A, B, C, D, E. B is the form in which an operational creditor has to submit. How can he submit? He can submit by registered post, by post basically, in person, by post or by electronic means. Please remember, courier is there only in individuals. Okay, here it is person, post or electronic means. Provided he has to submit supplementary information before the constitution of the committee of creditors. So if he needs any clarification, then he has to provide it before the constitution of the committee of creditors. Now, obviously, I leave you to read subregulation 2 by yourself. He has to give proof of his claim. 
right record with the information utility contract invoice order of a court or tribunal financial accounts this order of a court of tribunal and or financial information of financial accounts is a constant under everything and information utility is also mostly specified in operational creditors now uh, rather the in records with an information utility is coming in all three categories so that's the take off for this code the iu then claims by financial creditors it shall be submitted in form c again shall be supported by information utility financial contract record financial statement order of court or tribunal again here it says person can submit supplementary documents or clarifications before the constitution of committee of creditors then we come to workmen and employees in form d and e d when it's one workman or employee e where it is a collective of workmen or employees with an authorized representative again here what do they have to give record with the iu proof of employment notice demanding payment order of court or tribunal then we go to substantiation of claims now the rp can call such information as may be relevant to substantiate the claim provided by the creditor and regulation 11 says the cost of such substantiation or proving shall belong to the creditor it shall not be part of the process cost submission of proof of claim now in a public notice they have to give the name of the corporate debtor the authority with whom the corporate debtor is registered the name of the rp to whom the claim must be submitted the last date of submission of claims so here submission of proof of claims shall be done before the last date indicated in the notice which shall not be more than 14 days from the date of appointment of the rp within 3 days sorry within not not 14 days uh yeah within 3 days he has to give the public notice and within 14 days all the claims should be the last date of receipt of claims right so uh, uh, a creditor who submits to give the proof of the claim can submit it until the resolution plan is made and he will be included in the committee of creditors after the date of admission of his claim upon admission of his claim and just because he was not there in the committee of creditors because of a delayed submission of claim it does not invalidate any part of the proceedings of the committee of creditors right he shall be included in the committee from the date of admission c123 then verification of claims so public notice is 3 days from the date of appointment okay within 14 days the claims shall be received from the date of his appointment so it's actually maximum is 11 days and then within 7 days he shall verify the claims and after that he will create a list of creditors where all, who all can see this list of creditors all the people who have submitted the claims obviously the members partners directors or guarantors of the corporate data they should be able to see the claims member partner director i am interested directly and guarantors three adjudicating authority obviously have the right to see four it shall be displayed on the website of the corporate data and it shall be presented at the first meeting of the committee of creditors because that's where you are actually saying this is the committee and this is the basis of constitution of the committee right we read that it's basically the financial creditors who largely be in the committee so just in terms this is important who all shall the list of creditors be shared with okay it shall be shared with the people who have submitted the information placed on the website of the corporate data shared with partners members directors and guarantors it shall be shared with the adjudicating authority and presented in the first coc meeting determination of amount of claim where it's not possible to precisely calculate or compute and define the claim the irp can make a best estimate 
and he will keep revising the best estimate that he has made based on subsequent information that he receives debt in foreign currency it shall be valued in indian currency at the official exchange rate as specified by the rbi on the insolvency commencement date please remember okay with this we conclude up to regulation 15 of the cirp process